Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming after two days of 10 hours of presentation, a barbecue that apparently was very well uh, provided in terms of drinks. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, the last day, I'm hoping you get uh, a still a bit of energy for me. I have loads. I'm, I'm awake still since 3 a.m. So, <laughs> so I'm totally ready for this. So I'm going to talk. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about satellite remote sensing and how you can use it in conservation. I saw a lot of little birds uh, behind bars yesterday, so I'm glad to say that this is a Twitter-friendly presentation. <laughs> I'm going to set quickly the context. I know we all know it, but to me it's important that we work under the same framework. So um, there has been uh, rapid changes in environmental conditions over the past 100 years. Climate change is one of them. But we also have seen an uh, increase of invasive species, um, habitat loss, uh, overexploitation, land degradation. And all of that has shaped uh, the recent decline in biodiversity captured by many indices, such as the Red List or the Living Planet Index. And that matters to us for many reasons, uh, but one of them where uh, mo more evidence is, uh, is being accumulated is that biodiversity matters for our well-being. I've seen many presentations looking at climate change uh, from the point of view of changes in average condition. And uh, I think it's quite nice to remember everyone that climate change is much more than that. It's also changes in seasonal pattern, changes in the frequency of extreme natural events, changes in concentration, and be please bear in mind that this is from uh, the perspective of a terrestrial ecologist. I completely forgot about acidification on this one. <laughs> but from the greenhouse gas perspective, uh, this all can have an impact on, uh, on the species and ecosystem. We have gained a tremendous amount of knowledge in terms of pathway uh, by which uh, changes in climatic conditions can impact uh, um, a species, either directly or directly impacting behavior, impacting uh, interaction, altogether uh, shaping uh, changes in energy budget, which may or may not affect uh, reproductive patterns, survival, sex ratio. And all of that is what shapes vulnerability of species to climate change. Uh, whenever I think about um, a framework for action, I always tend to go back to the framework uh, by the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity. And to me, this is a perfect framework for a very simple reason. It reminds me that uh, a scientific understanding of what's going on shape our ability to respond to it, but we, s we, we systematically need to evaluate back what we are doing and see whether the science we have so far is good enough to design efficient mitigation strategy. So the Convention on Biological Diversity Framework simply uh, differentiate pressure to the environment, and that can be, among other things, climate change. It also look at the state of uh, the environment uh, in terms of looking at um, the structural, the functional, and the compositional attribute of biodiversity. So really taking into account the fact that biodiversity is not just about species, it's also about ecosystem, it's also about population and genetics. And then looking at ways to mitigate whatever uh, uh, understanding we get about the impact of those pressure on biodiversity by designing a multiple response such as a setting new protected area, or developing a, a new vaccination uh, campaign. And my thesis here is that you can inform a lot of this framework using satellite remote sensing. So why would you bother about uh, trying to understand satellite remote sensing? If, like me, you work in an area where there's very little data, it's a really big scale, there's it's not that safe to go, it's mostly area where no one goes and there's little funding, then this is a product that you would, that this type of data you would really value. It gives you a world coverage, it's relatively cheap, at least way cheaper than sending a bunch of people to try to collect those data at that type of extent and resolution. It's reproducible, it's sustainable, most importantly, it's transparent. If you don't trust me, you can download da those data, which are mostly free, and check what I'm, I'm saying to see whether you agree or not. And interestingly, over the past two decades, it has been linked to a lot of uh, processes in ecology. So um, a bunch of, sp of studies have now shown that you can relate uh, information derived from satellite data to uh, behavioral uh, trait, uh, population dynamics, uh, and even uh, macroecology. 
So I'm quickly going through uh, some example of what you can do with those satellite data. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you are familiar with actually satellite product because uh, admittedly I've seen a lot of presentation about SDM. And <laughs> if you're doing an SDM, you're probably searching for those environmental layers and the chances are a lot of them are derived from satellite product. And yes, you can get a lot of direct information about changes in, in uh, uh, temperature, sea surface temperature from satellite data, but you also can get information about other pressure that may interact with uh, climate change in shaping the vulnerability of species. So for example, I'm a big fan of underdogs. So I tend to work in areas where no one else or very few people actually go in. One of them is desert. Most people think that desert is a trash. There's nothing to conserve, there's very little thing, and actually there's a lot of war and terrorism, so why would you bother? <laughs> and, there's a, and there's clearly very little conservation funding that goes in deserts. The problem is deserts and dry land in general support the livelihood of millions of people. The biodiversity in there is unique, and it's quite now faced with a lot of anthropogenic uh, changes. And the latest report just for the Sahara uh, reported over 90% average uh, decrease in distribution range of all the megafauna there. So it's quite a place where for conservation purpose you, you should be interested in it. Um, the thing is um, there's a lot of things happening because no one's looking and one of them is uh, selling land for oil exploration. And this is um, Niger with a protected area here that is uh, seen as a hotspot for megafauna conservation in the Sahara. And all the uh, area in the red are places that have been sold, uh, sold for oil exploration just nearby the protected area and no one knows what the companies are doing or, or how much is damaging the ecosystem. Satellite data provide you a, a free way to actually detect those oil exploration sites and know how they are expanding and whether or not they, they, um, they provide a threat to those species that are already faced with a, a drastic change in environmental condition, the climatic condition. Other examples also in the, in the uh, Sahara, Sahara Sahel ecosystem, this is a protected area which sits between the true desert of the Sahara and the Sahel. And as you know, the Sahel has been greening. And uh, one of the consequences of climate change over there is that uh, an area that used to be mostly quite dry is starting to become green. When things become green, uh, livestock start to come in. And what they do um, is to try to provide water for this livestock, which means that artificial water holes have just been uh, increasing drastically uh, in those, uh, those protected areas. Protected areas that are right now considered uh, for the reintroduction of the scimitar or rex in Chad. Again, no information about how those uh, artificial water points are expanding. And that is quite an important information because those water points create some new uh, competition with uh, wildlife there. And again, satellite data, free data to just map where they are, get an actual map and map the, the changes in their distribution over time to inform management, but particularly reintroduction of threatened species. I know that it has been highly popular that uh, you can use satellite to detect species and a lot of people come to me saying, can I see my whales, my, my penguin, my, my whatever, using satellite data. You probably can, but most likely you will need to pay a lot of money because those very high resolution data are, do not come for free. But don't stop there. Uh, biodiversity is much more than just species, it's also ecosystem. And you can do a hell of a lot with free satellite data in terms of looking at changes in the structural and in the functional attributes of biodiversity. Two examples. First one is the Sundarban ecosystem, uh, and, and a UNESCO mangrove, biggest mangrove in the world, sitting between <coughs> India and Bangladesh. And we were the first one, to my surprise, to actually report uh, coastal recession using free radar data uh, with up to 100 to 100, up to 170 meter loss of mangrove, coastal mangrove, in less than two years. So that's something that had, that had an impact in terms of thinking about uh, sea rise, climate change, and the protection of a highly threatened ecosystem, and that's what mangroves are. Other stuff, other example, how you can use satellite data to have a look at uh, uh, functions, ecosystem functions. So here we had a look at changes in primary productivity, a key uh, ecosystem process 
in uh, protected area areas uh, in Africa. So we looked at over 160 uh, protected areas and look at changes in dynamic over the past 30 years. And what was really cool here is that we were able to confirm that the prediction from the IPCC in terms of how climate change should affect uh, the functioning of ecosystem, where actually it was much in those protected areas that were highly uh, protected. And then thinking about response, uh, as um, you've seen many of uh, the talks for the past two days, uh, SDM are a way to think about assisted colonization and reintroduction, in, and they, therefore satellite data can provide you valuable information as an input uh, in your species distribution model. Interestingly also, there's more and more work as to how they can help with the, the data on uh, species distribution to also input your species distribution model. But another example that is less discussed is how it can inform reintroduction by looking at habitat chains. Basically, a species disappears from an environment, you want to bring it back, but is that environment comparable to the environment where it was before? And that kind of information, well, you can get it from satellite by looking at patterns before and after the disappearance of the species, because we have over 40 years of data now on, uh, on that kind of information. So the take-home messages, um, I agree with many uh, that have said that climate change may or may not uh, be the strongest determinant of, of changes in biodiversity. However, whatever the strengths of it, what's sure is that it's having an impact on biodiversity and the ecosystem, the delivery of ecosystem services, and that the pathway are complex. They are complex because there are interaction between the different threats. And frankly, we don't do enough research as understanding how those interactions work, because mostly we only focus on one threat instead of being more integrative and trying to understand those interactions. I strongly believe that if you want to do any kind of mitigation strategy, you'll, you'll need to become way more interdisciplinary and integrative. <laughs> in particular, uh, you'll have to face the challenges of dealing with people in other disciplines to get more data, those data that we need, on the processes driving changes in biodiversity, on biodiversity monitoring itself, but also on the effectiveness of management action uh, in the face of uh, climate change. I hope I've convinced you that satellite data is one way to get this information. But admittedly, um, despite all its potential, there is still some issues. Issues which are related to data cost, capacity building and uh, interdisciplinary challenges. Namely, I don't know whether you have ever uh, tried to talk to someone outside your discipline, but it's like talking a new language. And I think someone on the first day was telling, uh, I think Emma from uh, the cultural uh, uh, session, was saying that most of the time it's just impossible to understand what, what the other is telling you. And that's because we develop our own languages and are really bad at communicating outside it. Uh, so if we want to improve opportunity for satellite data, to inform ecology and conservation, it means that we need to be able to talk to remote sensing experts, space agency, which are the ones that get the data and provide it to you, and also uh, for them to be able to interact with those ecologists and conservationists as well as the policy maker. The problem is that there's not many platforms where we all meet. It's very random. We mostly stay within our community. Um, we struggle to understand each other for sure. We have conceptual differences, which means that even if we use words that we think we both understand, actually we, we don't understand the same. We don't have the same agenda, and that's a problem. If research agenda are not coordinated and one goes in one direction, the other one does something else, and basically you miss a lot of opportunity. And also there's a real problem of valuing interdisciplinary work. Most of those interdisciplinary work are struggling to get some recognition, to get published, and to get funding. Another issue uh, is uh, with the product. As ecologists, many ecologists take for granted that those layers for the SDM will always be there. And that's not true. That's all dependent on funding. And if we are not able to help the space agency and uh, the people that uh, produce those data on the long term, then nobody values it and therefore it eventually stops. And that was the case of Landsat. For too long we waited, Landsat 7 stayed up even though it was not working very well and it took years to have a new Landsat because no one really expressed how valuable those data were for the ecological community. Uh, another issue is also to, uh, on to kind of agree on what scale we want to work with. I've seen many ecologists coming to me and say, well, you know, that little paddock uh, in my study area, I can't see it with Landsat, it's just too broad, we just need very high 
resolution data. And my answer to this, if you can go with a GPS tracker and walk and actually do the shape, then why on earth are you trying to do that with a satellite? Satellite data are there when you're working with big stuff and you want long-term data, things you couldn't do by just going around, walking and being in the field. Those approaches are complementary. They are not there to replace one another. And also, um, to finish off, there's a, an important need uh, to take responsibility. Responsibility in terms of uh, uh, data production. For the moment, it's very unclear as to who is dedicated to produce what over what time scale. So I always love when you get those news about the latest sensor that goes up or those new drones that, that could map X, Y, Z. It's great if you're doing a one-off study, but if you're interested in population dynamics and long-term effects, you need long-term data. If you need long-term data, you need to have someone that dedicates a lot of its time to produce those data for the next 20 years, not for the next five minutes. So there are solutions so far. There's been a lot of platform to try to facilitate the dialogue between the remote sensing expert and the biodiversity community, as well as with space agency and policymakers. So the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite has now a biodiversity task, and uh, the, uh, the GEO has a biodiversity uh, observation network trying to bring those people together. There's also some effort to try to improve capacity building within the ecological community, basically get all of us to understand how to use those data in the most efficient way. So there's a lot of courses, there's webinars, there's, there's all kind of actions sponsored uh, mostly by the, by the space agency. And the space agency have also tried to work as well as a federal uh, agency to try to improve data access. And um, there has been an increase in uh, accessibility of open source software. And finally, there's been some uh, effort to try to prioritize uh, satellite production through the essential biodiversity variable. And most importantly, <laughs> There's been some effort to try to uh, help the synchronization of scientific agenda by trying to create new journals that integrate those uh, community better, providing a, a, a common platform for publication. But there still need to be done. Uh, if you want one advice, stop specializing your uh, student too early. And what you're doing is what you're making is students that are unable to talk to any other community. Um, I would also say that we need some clear funding for uh, interdisciplinary monitoring work as well as a better evaluation of applied and interdisciplinary work and also try to get the community to mix up. So, uh, basically trying to those, those uh, remote experts to attend a uh, conference such as this one and us to go to uh, stuff such as the ESRSC or the SPCR. And finally, trying to get way to consult everybody. It's very difficult to engage a whole community into something that means so much for so many people. And I stop here. I'm slightly over that. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do a final plug by saying that if you're a woman in science in Australia, and sorry, I can't, I can't not mention it, then apply because Subbox Science is coming to Australia for the first time this year. And uh, I've seen it uh, growing in the UK. I really hope it will take off in Australia. That depends on the engagement of the scientific community here. So please apply. Thank you.